Welcome back here to our lecture series. This is chapter 11 up for today. Chapter 11 deals with chemical bonding. In this first part of this two-part lecture, we're going to talk about the different types of bonding, from ionic bonding to covalent bonding. All right, I think we should get started. And now, part one of chemical bonding. All right, everybody, uh, welcome here to chapter 11 up for today. And chapter 11, kind of continue on there with the previous chapter. We're going to talk about electrons. Here we're going to talk about electrons and bonding. Uh, we'll also see some periodic trends here to start the chapter, uh, which will help us understand really why we get certain types of bonds to form uh, when certain elements do come together. Uh, we will get into two types of bonding, ionic versus covalent bonding. We'll talk about how to properly draw Lewis structures, and we'll finish up with some geometry here in this chapter. So let's get started with a little bit about the periodic trends and some of the important trends that help us understand what's going on in terms of bonding. Uh, we talked about this, I think, in the last chapter, but just to reiterate, uh, valence electrons are really an important type of electrons here in bonding. They are the ones that are involved in actual bonding. Um, they are not all the electrons that an element has. They are the highest uh, energy level uh, electrons. They are the furthest away from the nucleus. And those are some of the reasons why they're actually involved in bonding. Uh, our valence electrons, as we talked about, if we take our nitrogen like we have down there, 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, our electron configuration for nitrogen. Remember that these front numbers here are the principal quantum numbers, which again is that fancy word for the energy level. And if we sort of analyze our electron configuration here for nitrogen, uh, we do see that on the first energy level, which is right here, uh, we have two electrons. That is the ground state, right? N equals one, principal quantum number one is what is referred to as the ground state closest to the nucleus. Uh, we actually have several electrons here on the second energy level. And we have two here in an S orbital. We have three here in a P subshell. And that is a grand total of five electrons here on the second energy level. So. For nitrogen, uh, it has five valence electrons. These lower energy electrons, which are closer to the nucleus, uh, they are sometimes referred to as core electrons. But it is the valence electrons, uh, which are really important, especially what we're gonna talk about in this chapter, as they are the ones that participate in bonding. So as you can see here, uh, you could write out the electron configuration for everybody or whoever you're looking at. For example, 1s2, uh, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. That is our friend sodium, 11 electrons. And once again here, first energy level, two electrons. Second energy level, two and six is eight electrons. And on the third energy level, one electron. So in terms of sodium, it has one valence electron. So remember that you definitely could write out the electron configuration to figure out the number of valence electrons, but much easier, right, is that the valence electrons uh, does equal the group number. And when we go to periodic table, that is what we're talking about. Our one, two, skip the middle, three, four, five, five, six, seven, eight. The number of valence electrons will equal our group number here. So sodium group one, one valence electron. Nitrogen group five, five valence electrons right about there. And obviously sodium is right about there. And again, that is really the much easier way to figure out valence electrons. Good news is, as we might have talked about in the previous chapter, we did talk about how to figure out the number of valence electrons uh, there are for transition metals. Uh, the good news is in bonding, probably not going to come across much transmission, transition metals in terms of uh, having to figure out the valence electrons and drawing Lewis structures. So most of the time it is going to be our representative elements that we're going to see in Lewis structures. So 
group number equals the number of valence electrons. Much easier way to remember that or figure out how many valence electrons there are. So as we just talked about there, something like fluorine, which is group seven, has seven valence electrons. Chlorine also has seven valence electrons. Once again, something from fluorine, uh, which is number nine on the periodic table, 1s2, uh, 2s2, 2p5. And once again, it is the second energy level here. And those seven electrons, which is uh, chlor uh, fluorines, uh, valence electrons. Once again, this being over here, these two are our core electrons. Core electrons, as we'll talk about again, um, very close to the nucleus, uh, held really tightly because of that and are not involved in bonding. So they're definitely there. They're still there in the element, um, but they are not involved in the bonding process. Just those valence electrons are involved. So let's talk a little about some periodic trends and what we see sort of happening on the periodic table and with metals and non-metals. So as we've talked about up until this point, uh, we know both of these guys uh, will basically do one of two things. And this will typically happen when they get together. When we have metals and non-metals getting together, we are going to get electrons transferred. And remember that it is the metals that typically will make our cations, which are positively charged ions. It is the non-metals that will typically make our anions, uh, which are negatively charged ions. And that definitely happens when those two things get together, both the metals and the non-metals. So as we go down a group on the periodic table, especially metals, uh, for example, group one, they will give up their electrons a lot easier as you go down that group. Uh, so we also will see that in terms of reactivity. So ultimately what we will see, and we're going to talk here why that is in just a second, we will ultimately see, for example, group one coming down gives up their electrons. So typically speaking, your most reactive metal, remember metals are on the left-hand side of the periodic table, is typically found in this part of the periodic table, lower left of the periodic table. Opposites or trends, as we will talk about, will find that your most reactive non-metal will be found upper right of the periodic table. So we're gonna now talk about really some what are referred to as periodic trends. Uh, that help us understand why that is, why we see the most reactive metal on the lower left, most reactive non-metal on the upper right, and ultimately why metals will lose electrons and become positively charged, while non-metals will gain electrons <clears throat> and become negatively charged. So one of the first sort of ideas as to, for example, why valence electrons, for example, are involved in bonding where perhaps core electrons are not. We could look at something which is sometimes referred to as effective nuclear charge. And this is sometimes referred to as the effective. And the effective nuclear charge is a pretty simple sort of idea. I guess we'll talk about it in a very simplified match it, uh, manner. It's a very simplified idea of why certain electrons are held tighter than other electrons. So let's take something like our friend lithium, for example, that has three electrons, 1s2, 2s1. So lithium obviously has three electrons, also has three protons, which means if I just draw like its nucleus, it basically has a positive three charge basically there from the protons that are in the nucleus. Obviously it has neutrons as well. They have no charge, so not really an effect here. Now I'm gonna draw the electrons here. We have a couple electrons there on the first energy level, which are these. These are our core electrons. We also have another electron, which is our valence electron on the second energy level kind of here. Remember, again, they're not flying around in pretty circles or anything like this, but for our purposes of 
this illustration will kind of draw them like this. Now, one important thing to keep in mind when we talk about sort of electrostatic attraction, which is the opposites attraction to each other. This attraction is a very, very strong attraction. It actually gets stronger with charge. So the larger the positive negative charge, the stronger the attraction. So something was, for example, a plus three charge and like a minus three charge will actually be held together tighter, for example, than if you had like a plus one, minus one sort of charge coming together. So when we look at our core electrons here, they are again randomly flying around, but they are fairly close here to the nucleus, which means that these guys are going to feel that full brunt of that positive three charge from that nucleus, which means they're going to be held very, very tightly. Now, when we get to our valence electron, which is out here, our valence electron, it is actually not going to feel the full brunt of that positive three charge from the nucleus. So why is that? It is that because in front of them, if you will, they have these electrons that are doing what is sometimes referred to as shielding. And it is pretty much what the name sounds like. They are shielding that valence electron from the full brunt of that positive three charge. So you can think of it like, you know, you went to the movies or something like that, you know, I guess before they assigned seats, uh, you went to the movies, you got there early, got a really nice seat right dead center uh, in the screen. And right before, for example, uh, the movie starts, somebody comes and sits in front of you with a big giant, say, cowboy hat, really big hat or something like that. They just shielded part of that screen for you, and you're not going to be able to see the whole screen. Same idea here. Those lower energy electrons, those core electrons, are closer to the nucleus, and they're sort of shielding that positive three charge, in the case of lithium here, from getting fully past them and hitting that valence electron, which means instead of that valence electron feeling the full strength of that positive three charge, bringing it closer to the nucleus, it feels something a lot less than that positive three charge. You could actually calculate it, for example, by calculating Z effective, we could take the positive three charge from the nucleus here uh, and we can subtract basically how many electrons are screening them, are shielding it. And in this case, on the lower energy level, we got a couple of electrons. And that's going to give us basically a minus two. Which means this is effectively the positive charge that that valence electron is actually feeling at this point, which is actually only a plus one attraction. Now, remember, that's going to be much, much less of an attractive force than those lower energy electrons are feeling where they feel the full brunt of that positive three charge. So what does that mean? It means that, frankly, this valence electron out here is not going to be drawn in as close as obviously our core electrons will. And because of that, it's going to be held on, but not as tightly. And that is why valence electrons in general are able to, for example, be lost and given up because although they're being held, they're not being held as tightly as those core electrons. It's also why they could kind of be shared as well. They're not being held as tightly. It also accounts, for example, why certain elements will make only a certain type of charge. For example, lithium, which is group one, will make a plus one charge because it only has one little electron that is not being held as tightly. And that's the only one it's able to really lose. As we'll talk about in just a second, can't really lose those core electrons because they're sitting right up next to the nucleus in a sense. They're held super tight and they're not going to lose them under normal conditions. So 
In addition to this, this is why certain elements have fixed positive charges and will only lose a certain number of electrons. And we'll talk a little more about that with the next sort of trend that we see. The general trend in effective nuclear charge is on the periodic table. Uh, and in general increases as you go to the right and decreases as you go down. Um, <clears throat> as you go to the right, uh, the sort of the buildup, if you look at the periodic table, atomic numbers get larger to the right, which means in the nucleus it's going to have a much higher positive charge and it's going to bring all the electrons that are there in closer. Then to the left where you don't have as large of a positive charge, uh, you have a little bit more electrons as well, and they're not going to be brought in as tighter to the nucleus. Another really important periodic trend is ionization energy. And ionization energy is the energy that's required basically to remove an electron from the gas phase of an atom. And this is a, an equation here. For example, we have a metal, no charge. It will lose an electron. Electron is on the product side of the equation here, like it's being given off. And obviously we will then have our metal becoming positively charged. Metals have relatively low ionization energy and non-metals have relatively high ionization energy. And actually electrons come off one at a time. So for example, we had magnesium. The first thing that would happen is magnesium would lose an electron and it would come off. Next thing that would happen is this guy with a plus one charge would lose another electron and become a plus two charge. Then maybe it continues on. We'll talk about does it really continue on in just a second, but maybe it looks something like this plus this. Now, the electrons actually do come off one at a time. And this is what is sometimes referred to as the first ionization energy. The second electron comes off is known as the second ionization energy. Third one is the third ionization energy. So sometimes people think all the electrons sort of drop off all at once. Uh, they actually don't. They do come off in sort of a stepwise fashion, one at a time. Uh, and every time it comes off, it's referred to as an ionization energy, first, second, third, however many electrons uh, may come off. The general trend for first ionization energy is what we see here. Uh, this is basically first ionization energy. And that is, it increases on the periodic table as you go up and to the right and decreases basically as you go down and to the left. Looking at that here, for example, here's our first, uh, second, and third ionization energy. And in general, it uh, takes more energy to remove an electron after the first one is removed. Uh, so for example here, let's take our friend lithium. Uh, we have our lithium that would lose one electron. And then this guy maybe will lose another. And this again would be our first ionization energy. This would be our second ionization energy. And when we look at this, for example, our electron configuration, as we wrote it before, is something like this, one valence electron there, two core electrons, right? It's electrons. So if we look at lithium, which is right here on this table from your book, we see that the first ionization energy required to remove that first electron, about 520 kilojoules. Not bad, does happen. Now, look at the jump here. I don't even know, over a tenfold jump in energy to try to remove that second electron. And heck, if you try to remove that third electron, look at the jump in energy as we go from here to here. Uh, that's also what we see is as we go from first ionization energy to second to third, 
it takes a lot more energy to continuously remove electrons. Why is that? Well, in a neutral guy, right? No charge. Uh, and we lose an electron. It's the size of the cation here. Is it smaller or larger? And hopefully the answer you have is it is smaller, right? And that's because it lost some of his electrons, it lost his electron cloud a little bit, and actually becomes smaller. What else happens? Well, if we look at the case of lithium here, after we lose that first electron, which is the valence electron, we are now into our core electrons. And that is what these two are, right? These are our core electrons. Good luck trying to remove those because as it shrinks, right? We just think about our three electrons here in our plus three sort of charge. Once we get rid of this valence electron, now that plus three is gonna pull those guys in even closer. And those core electrons are actually even closer to the nucleus at this point, which means they're gonna be held even tighter. So this is why, for example, again, lithium, not gonna happen under normal conditions because those are core electrons it will only be able to lose its valence electrons in this case. Uh, same thing here, for example, if you looked at something uh, like sodium, sodium's first electron, not bad. Then you're about a tenfold jump. And then once again, for sodium, you're now into its core electrons and you're not going to lose those. So this is why when we look at the periodic table, group one plus one, group two plus two, group three plus three, this is because once you get rid of those valence electrons, it is going to be virtually impossible under normal conditions to pull off those core electrons because they start really close to the nucleus. They're held really tightly because of that effective nuclear charge. And now with that extra electron gone, they're even smaller and closer to the nucleus, those electrons overall size is smaller of the ion in that case. And it makes it even harder to remove those electrons. By the way, just speaking about it opposite, right? When we talk about anions, right? Uh, they actually gain electrons. So in terms of the neutral element and the guy that becomes negatively charged, actually larger when it becomes an anion, right? Because it actually gains electrons to its nuclear uh, sort of cloud. So ionization energy, we associate with the formation of cations and the general pathway there is up and to the right, ionization energy increases, down to the left, it decreases. Let's talk about a couple other, maybe I'll write it, uh, I'll write it here, I think. <clears throat> I've got a couple other important trends too. And that is a couple here that kind of sound similar, but they are different. One is electron affinity. And electron affinity is the energy change when an atom gains. Electrons. So when an atom gains electrons, it's really the energy difference that occurs. If you have an affinity for something, right, you like it. So you like electrons. And this is sort of what we think about with anions being formed, just like we kind of think of ionization energy with cations. Anions, we think about electron affinity. And on the periodic table, it increases as you go this way. And it decreases as you go this way. It is not a perfect sort of arrangement, if you will. Um, but that is the general trend that you have. Now, another important thing is something that sometimes people get confused with electron affinity, which is electro negativity. And electro negativity is the ability of an atom to bring electrons towards itself. So electronegativity is the ability basically of an atom to not just uh, hold on to their electrons, but kind of attract electrons towards itself. And on the periodic table, 
it increases as you go up and to the right and decreases as you go down. Fluorine is actually the most electronegative element you could have there. So all of these trends are really important when we think about what's happening on the periodic table. What we see here is actually the trend in atomic size. So atomic size here, decreases as you go up and to the right and increases as you go down and to the left. So if we take all these sort of periodic trends that we've just talked about and kind of put them together here, kind of over the periodic table-ish, uh, we got uh, atomic size as we go this way. Uh, we got Z effective increasing and decreasing as you go down. Uh, we also have, we have ionization energy increasing as you go up and to the right, decreasing as you go down. We have electron affinity. Increasing as you go up and to the right, decreasing as you go down, and we have electronegativity. Obviously, these aren't perfectly drawn where they are, but this is a general trend. Electronegativity increasing as you go up to the right. Once again, fluorine are most electronegative and decreasing as you go down. So, what do all these trends have in common in terms of what we see on the periodic table? Well, as we go up and to the right on the periodic table, so upwards and to the right on the periodic table, we have a much smaller overall size because of the Z effective, which means even the further electrons, the valence electrons are actually closer to the nucleus and held tighter. And because of that, they're held tighter to the nucleus because the overall size is smaller they have very high ionization energy, which means it takes a lot of energy to try to remove an electron from a nonmetal up and to the right. And that usually doesn't happen. In fact, they have a very high electron affinity, which means they like to gain electrons. In addition, they have a very high electronegativity, which means they like to bring electrons towards themselves. So up and to the right on the periodic table, that is where we have our nonmetals. And as we know, our nonmetals for these reasons here are the ones that typically will gain electrons and also form anions when they do. So what happens when we hit bottom left there of the periodic table? Well, this is where we have our metals, which are much larger in size. They have a lower Z effective, which means their outer electrons aren't going to be pulled in as tightly to the nucleus and not held as tightly. They have very low ionization energy, which means they're in no interest in hanging on to their electrons because they're not very close to the nucleus. And they have low electron affinity and low electronegativity, which means they're not interested in basically gaining electrons. Actually, if you want to think about it, kind of interested in, go ahead, take my electrons, please. So this is why what we see with metals, they are typically the ones that will lose electrons and become positive cations when they do. This is also why we saw earlier the most reactive metal in this corner, because if they are not interested in hanging on to their electrons, and they're not looking to gain electrons, that makes them quite reactive because if you just look at them wrong, their electron is gonna go, and that's gonna make them really, really reactive. That's also why upper right here, around fluorine, is our most reactive nonmetal for the same sort of reason. They're not gonna give away their electrons, but they're more than happy to take somebody else's electrons and bring them towards themselves, which makes them very, very reactive. So these periodic trends that we just talked about are the reason why we say 
our most reactive metal lower left of the periodic table, most reactive non-metal upper right of the periodic table, and also why we see metals willing to lose electrons and become positively charged cations, and why we see non-metals typically gain electrons and become negatively charged anions. So these periodic trends really do explain a lot of what we see happening with these certain elements. So let's talk a little bit about bonding here and Lewis dot symbols. Uh, Lewis dot symbols are also sometimes just generically referred to as electron dot symbols. So we use uh, electron dot symbols or Lewis dot symbols to help us understand what's going on with bonding. Um, and remember, as we talked about, it's only the valence electrons that are involved in bonding. Uh, there's definitely other electrons there, but they're not involved in bonding. So basically to show the valence electrons and what's happening with those valence electrons, uh, should be an E there. Um, we use these Lewis dot symbols and Lewis dot symbols is basically the symbol and one dot to represent each of the valence electrons that there are. Um, so for example, is there a rule as to how you put the dots on? So if X is our symbol, there's really kind of no rule. Uh, the only rule is kind of no more than two dots per side. So most of the time we will kind of usually put one at a time and then come back and pair them up. Doesn't really necessarily have to be that way, but most of the time that way. And this brings up a very important number when we talk about bonding. That means that if I put two on a side and should never have more than two on a side, that gives me a uh, two, four, six, and eight. Eight is a big number here in bonding. It is sort of what everybody is trying to get to in terms of bonding. And if we think about that and look at the periodic table here, what I made one day uh, when I was, should get a hobby here, but I guess I made it one day here when I was bored. Uh, here's some Lewis structures or Lewis dot symbols really for each of these things. But that eight number is really important because if we think about it, uh, that's group number eight has eight valence electrons around them. And that is really the goal here of all bonding that we've talked about before we're gonna do an electron configuration and we'll talk about it here in this chapter the goal of everybody in terms of bonding is to basically hit that noble gas configuration in terms of electrons again they're very very stable and that is really the purpose of both types of bonding that we deal with both covalent bonding and ionic bonding so let's talk about sort of the difference uh, between those two and what's going on here. And I think we talked about it when we did nomenclature, but a reminder that an ionic compound is always uh, between a metal and a non-metal. And the deal here is pretty simple. Metal is going to send those electrons over to the non-metal. Uh, the metal is going to become a cation, which is positively charged non-metal for those reasons we just talked about will become an anion which is negatively charged and it is that electrostatic attraction which is a fancy way of saying opposites attract that holds that together there is absolutely no sharing of electrons in a ionic compound a covalent compound on the other hand as we will talk about is always a couple of non-metals together. And when we have a couple of non-metals that come together, uh, we actually get sharing of electrons here. And as we will talk about that sharing uh, may be equal. Or it may be unequal, but there is some aspect of sharing that is going on. And we'll talk why that is shortly, uh, but that is the major difference between the two types of bonding, ionic bonding and covalent bonding. Ionic, no sharing of electrons, ions being formed, attraction between positive and negative, 
to non-metals sharing of electrons happening. Now, things that have low ionization energy will tend for cations. Things with high negative electron affinity will tend to form those anions. So the general rule tells us that basically elements most likely to form cations are kind of found on the left-hand side of the periodic table. Again, because they have all those periodic trends, it's going to allow them to lose electrons. And upper right there in the periodic table are halogens and oxygen, are typically our guys are going to make negatively charged ions. So let's take a look at what happens here in an ionic bond. So we have lithium fluoride we want to look at. And if we write the electron configuration for each of these things, uh, lithium is 1s2, uh, 2s1, uh, fluorine 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. So first off, uh, we definitely want to make sure we understand that this right here is ionic. So how do I know it's ionic? Frankly, I know lithium is a metal. Fluoride, which is fluorine, is a non-metal. And frankly, whenever you have that combination right there, metal and a non-metal together, that should ring the bell right there that that is going to be an ionic compound going to have no sharing of electrons happening here. We're going to have a complete transfer of electrons from uh, really the metal to the non-metal is essentially what's going to happen here. So if we were to look at Lewis dot symbols here to represent what's happening, lithium is group one, which means it has one valence electron right there. It has its electron configuration of 1s2, 2s1. And fluorine, which is group seven, has seven valence electrons. In this case, two, four, six, and seven right there. One S2, uh, two S2, two P5. All right, so what's gonna happen in this case? Well, because of those periodic trends, lithium's gonna go, go ahead and take my electron. Fluorine's gonna go, thank you very much. I was looking for an electron. And it's going to gain that electron. Lithium's gonna lose that electron. It's at that point over here, lithium will then become positively charged and fluorine will then gain that electron and become negatively charged in this case. And once again, there is no sharing of electrons here. It's the positive and negative charge that's holding that together. And when you draw a Lewis symbols to represent ionic bonding, like we see here with lithium fluoride, you do need to make sure, and I'll just circle them here. You don't have to circle them, but you do need to make sure that you include the charges. You also typically could bracket each of them or at least one of them uh, to indicate that those electrons are not being shared, that there's been a full transfer of electrons from one to the next. So, why is this important that this happens? What happens with our lithium? Well, lithium lost an electron and it's going to lose its valence electron, which means when lithium with a plus one charge is over here, it has an electron configuration of 1s2. That one electron that came over to the fluorine, it's going to be okay because fluorine has one more spot right there in the 2p subshell. Remember, it can hold six total electrons. And that is where this guy is going to pick up that electron. Now, two really important things just happened through that transfer of one electron. And that is 1s2 is uh, two electrons. And on the periodic table, number two there is our friend helium. So that is the same electron configuration as helium. Uh, looking over here at fluoride, uh, we got two, four, and six is 10. And on the periodic table, that is our good friend, neon. And here we go. That is a noble gas. That is a noble gas. And that, once again, is the purpose of all bonding to achieve noble gas configuration. So in the case of our metal and non-metal, the way that they are able to achieve noble gas configuration is 
is that they lose and gain electrons to do so. And as we talked about with electron configuration, if you look on the periodic table, hydrogen, we got helium, and we got lithium. So lithium just went backwards to helium and became the same in terms of its electrons as helium, which makes it really stable. And obviously fluorine, it's right about there, and that's neon. Fluorine went forward by gaining that electron to neon on the periodic table. They both achieved noble gas configuration, making them both very, very stable. So once again, this is basically what an ionic bond is. It is held together by the electrostatic attraction between the positively charged cation and the negatively charged anion. And ultimately, they both hit noble gas configuration, which makes them really, really stable. Let's take a look at another example, uh, calcium oxide. And if we were to do our Lewis dot symbols here, calcium is group number two, uh, which means it should have two valence electrons. And that's going to be electron configuration world here, argon. A little shorthand 4s2 and by the way those are the two valence electrons that we see in the picture and oxygen which is group number six so two four we'll do it like this five and six and oxygen coming in at 1s2 2s2 2p4 Steve. Now, what's going to happen here, once again, if we're not sure, we got calcium, which is a metal. We have oxide, which is oxygen, which is a non-metal. Once again, that is all you need to see to know that we're gonna have some electrons being transferred. And once again, this is gonna be an ionic bond situation. As soon as you see that metal, non-metal, that is all you need to look at. All right, so what's gonna happen in this case? Well. I'm going to imagine my metal there is going to get rid of some electrons. So he's going to send an electron over here. He's going to send an electron over there. And the result of this is my calcium just gave away two electrons. So it's going to become positively two charged. My oxygen picked up those two electrons. And now it's going to have some electrons all over. It picked up two electrons, which means it will end up as a minus two charge here. Once again, no electrons being shared. The attraction between those two charges is what's holding that together. Let's once again, take a look and see what happened in terms of our electron configuration as it became these ions. Well, calcium uh, got rid of its two valence electrons, which left it 18 electrons, or it ended up at argon's configuration noble gas configuration that's good oxygen had a space for those two electrons that came over and can put them in there at 1s2 2s2 2p6 6 8 10 that is neon's configuration so once again here we see with calcium oxide the losing and the gaining of electrons allowing us to uh, essentially reach that noble gas configuration, which is that really stable configuration. All right, so what happens though, if we say, put together two things we just looked at, say calcium, uh, which is our argon 4s2 and our two valence electrons. Let's say we put it together with fluorine we looked at earlier and this guy's got seven there 1s2 2s2 2p5 in this case all right well here we go uh calcium going to give away an electron there to fluorine but fluorine only has room for one electron at this point as you can see in the picture that is not good because if we look at our periodic table arrangement there, we got potassium, we got calcium, and back over here is argon. 
Calcium only gives away one electron. It finds itself at potassium, uh, which doesn't sound like a noble gas configuration at all. It's a little short. Uh, fluorine's okay. Fluorine's able to go forward there to neon. Uh, but that's going to be a little troublesome uh, there for calcium. So uh, we actually need not one fluorine in this case, but we actually need a second fluorine in this case. That second fluorine, which also has the same electron configuration and also room for one more electron there, can take my second electron here and take it and gain it. The result of this is calcium was able to lose two electrons total, one to each fluorine, and each fluorine picked up one electron. And because it picked up one electron, it has a minus one charge and one more, right? And what happened in terms of our electron configuration in this case? Well, by calcium being able to dump both of its electrons, it will actually end up at argon's configuration. Each fluorine able to basically put one electron in each of those spots will end up at 10, uh, which is neon's configuration for both of these guys. So in this case, all three of these elements by gaining and losing electrons are able to achieve noble gas configuration and that makes them all very stable. That is also why to tie it back to nomenclature that we talked about, if you remember whenever we take a positive ion and put it together with a negative ion, we want to put it together so the overall charge equals zero. The simplest way to do that, and in this case, we need not one of these guys, but we need two of them to give us our proper formula of CaF2. This is the real reason for that as to why you're told when you have an ionic compound, positive and negative charges together to equal zero in the simplest way possible, because in the simplest way possible, when the charge equals zero, that allows all the elements and atoms there to reach noble gas configuration. If you didn't do that and ended up with like CaF plus, you would end up in the situation we just talked about. You would end up with, we just did something like this. You would end up with calcium not getting back to noble gas, but stopping at potassium, and that is not good. So the reason why we tell people when you put a positive ion and negative ion together and these equal zero, the real reason for that is the bonding reason here. It allows everybody to achieve that really good, stable, noble gas configuration in terms of electrons. Also a reminder, as we talked about with electron configuration, uh, they do not change into that element. Uh, they're still the same element because the protons don't change, but they end up with the same type of electron arrangement as the noble gases, which makes them really stable. All right, so that's ionic bonding. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's talk about covalent bonding and a little bit of the difference that happens there. So with covalent bonding, uh, we're actually dealing with different things. So <clears throat> with covalent bonding, uh, this is pretty much to nonmetals. And when we get two nonmetals together, what happens is we're going to get some type of sharing of electrons that's going to occur. Once again, could be equal or unequal, but there is some aspect of sharing of electrons that basically occur in a covalent bond. Why is that? Why do we get sharing of electrons in a covalent bond? But in an ionic bond, we get transfer of electrons. It has to do with those periodic trends that we talked about. So if you think about just location, 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 metals are pretty much to the left of the periodic table. Non-metals are to the right. So when we get a metal and a non-metal together, they have very, very different periodic trends as we talked about. Metals want to give away their electrons. Non-metals want to gain electrons. So that is why in an ionic bond, as we just talked about, 
we get that full transfer of electrons, the losing and the gaining of electrons. But in a covalent situation, it's between two nonmetals. If you remember, nonmetals are pretty much all in the same spot on the periodic table, which means that they essentially all have very, very similar periodic trends in terms of what they want to do with electrons. They all have the similar periodic trends of, I don't want to give away my electrons and I want your electron. So because when two nonmetals get together, they both really want electrons, the best that they can kind of do is compromise and go, all right, I'm not gonna get rid of my electrons. Or you're not gonna get rid of your electrons. The best that we could do is let's just share them. And that's why in a covalent situation that involves two nonmetals, because they have very similar periodic trends, uh, they tend to share electrons rather than transfer electrons. So Lewis, hence Lewis structures, Lewis dot symbols, suggested a role of electrons in chemical bonding. Uh, so for example, here, if we get two hydrogen atoms together, remember that hydrogen is a nonmetal. So these two guys are actually going to share these electrons. And what happens is we get something that looks like this. And we get this overlapping of the 1s orbital. And within that overlapping area is where the electrons are being shared. Remember electron configuration for hydrogen 1s1, 1s1. That's why these are 1s orbitals overlapping when they come together, sharing of electrons happening. So when we count, the electrons for the hydrogen on the left. Uh, he's got two. Those two in the middle count for the hydrogen on the left. Just like in this case, the two in the middle count for the hydrogen on the right. That gives each hydrogen two electrons. So you may be saying, wait, I thought eight was the magical number. Eight is the magical number for everybody but hydrogen. So if you look at hydrogen on the periodic table, hydrogen's there. And the element that comes after hydrogen is our friend helium. So helium is a noble gas. And in this case, by the two hydrogens, for example, sharing the electrons, they both end up with two electrons, which gives them the same noble gas configuration, for example, as helium, uh, which means it is good. So that's something really, really important. Hydrogen, two only two electrons total should never have more than two. So I'll say it many times probably throughout this lectures in this chapter, but pretty much when you draw a hydrogen, this is what it should look like. Or if you use dots, it should look like this. You should never have a hydrogen with a line and a bunch of dots around it, unless you like an X, because it's incorrect. So it should only have two total electrons. This type of situation where we're sharing these electrons between the two atoms, they're mutually attracted to each nucleus in this case. Uh, this is what is known as covalent bond. And a covalent bond is the sharing of electrons. You could represent covalent bond and sharing of electrons with dots between two elements. You could also represent it with a line. And one line represents two dots or a pair of electrons. And that is what is known as a single bond. We also have a double bond, triple bond, which shares more electrons. And we'll see them in just a second. So a covalent bond is a bond between two nonmetals where those electrons being shared between the two atoms are attracted to each one's nucleus. And that's sort of the glue that holds it together, right? So you got kind of, uh, you know, if we take the hydrogen example here, think about the nucleus sort of here in my picture, you got these electrons attracted to the nucleus here, but also attracted to the nucleus on the other side. And that's sort of what kind of holds everything together uh, without it breaking apart. Taking a look at another example, fluorine, for example, here, if we write our electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. And if we look at our fluorine in this case, here we go. 
we have seven valence electrons in each of them as they're all group seven. Once again, because this is both nonmetals, identical nonmetals, we're going to get sharing of electrons that happens here. You draw it one, two ways, showing those sharing of electrons as dots in the middle, like we see here. Or you could use a line to represent those bond, uh, electrons that are being shared there within a bond. Once again, if we're counting, the electrons here in the middle count to the guy on the left. That gives it eight electrons. And those electrons in the middle also count for the fluorine on the right, giving it eight electrons. Once again, our magical number there of eight, group eight, which is our noble gases on the periodic table. So in this case, once again, we have two fluorines, both nonmetals, both identical nonmetals clearly have the exact same periodic trends in terms of electrons and the best they're going to do is actually share these electrons uh, between them <clears throat> now when we look at a drawing such as this there's actually two types of electrons that we actually see in these pictures all these electrons on the outside that have these big claws <laughs> sort of pointing to them uh, these are not involved in any type of bond. And I know that because there's no other element written on the other side of these dots. That is what is referred to as lone pairs. If you're old like me, but a lot of books now use non-bonding electrons. So non-bonding electrons, lone pairs, same deal. Um, and again, non-bonding electrons. Again, same deal in this case. Now, clearly the electrons being shared, which in this picture here is being represented by a line, also has a very creative name. And those are electrons being shared within a bond. And they are what are referred to as bonding electrons. So bonding electrons are the ones that are involved in a bond. And they're also the ones that can be shown one of two ways either as dots or as a line. So only bonding electrons are typically shown with lines. Non-bonding electrons or lone pairs are shown as dots. When you do draw Lewis structures, which we're going to talk about the uh, steps to draw them shortly, uh, you do want to make sure that you always include both types of electrons, both bonding electrons and non-bonding electrons uh, when you draw these pictures. So a Lewis structure is a structure that represents covalent bonding uh, using Lewis dot symbols where we show pairs of electrons as either a line or dots between them. Once again, only the valence electrons are shown in here. They have those core electrons. I apparently got A's where there should be E's. Um, I, they only show the valence electrons in these structures, but they still have those core electrons. But once again, uh, core electrons not involved in any type of bonding. If we draw a Lewis structure here for water, uh, same idea. We will have some sharing of electrons actually happening here. And actually the oxygen in the middle sharing electrons with both hydrogens. i uh, going to give it eight electrons. And each of the hydrogens uh, sharing with the oxygen will be able to get its two electrons making them both very happy and again that's the same thing we see here with our fluorine that we saw earlier that brings us to we sort of talked about it but let's officially talk about the two important numbers here in terms of bonding the first one is the octet rule and the octet rule basically says everybody will continue to make bonds until they have eight electrons around them Again, the purpose of covalent bonding, ionic bonding, all bonding is for everybody to end up at that noble gas configuration, which is eight valence electrons. And that's really the purpose of it. The one super important exception is again, hydrogen, only two electrons as sometimes referred to as the duet rule. And once again, that is because hydrogen just needs to get the helium uh, to be happy and okay. Let's talk a little bit about multiple bonds. Uh, so single bonds 
in terms of, for example, getting to the octet rule. Sometimes you just need a single bond. And as we see here with fluorine, a single bond is the sharing here, right here, of two electrons or a pair of electrons represented by a single line. Now, sometimes as we'll talk about, uh, it takes a little bit more in terms of bonding to get to the octet rule. And something like carbon dioxide actually has two double bonds. Double bonds are the sharing of two pairs of electrons or four electrons. And that's represented by two lines. As you can see here, four electrons, four electrons represented as two lines. And we could have a triple bond. And in some cases, a triple bond is necessary to get to the octet rule. Nitrogen, for example, here, a uh, triple bond is the sharing of six electrons or three pairs of electrons represented with dots are lines. So here, this six electrons being shared by nitrogen, also here in our carbon being shared are represented as three lines. So every time you see a line in terms of Lewis structures, uh, represents bonding electrons. It represents a bond that is formed and also represents two electrons or one pair of electrons. So let's talk a little bit about electronegativity. So covalent bonding is obviously sharing of electrons. So electronegativity, as we talked about a second ago, is again, that ability of an atom to bring electrons towards itself. And really, it is the overwhelmingly decision point, if you will, as to how electrons are going to be shared. Will they be shared equally? Will they be shared unequally? And it's really the electronegativity that we really look at to help us determine those sort of questions. How are those electrons going to be shared between something? So if we look at something like H2, which is an identical element, On each side, those electrons here, we would expect since they are both hydrogen uh, to basically share those electrons equally, uh, which basically means those electrons in the middle are gonna have kind of the same pull, if you will, to each of the hydrogens. The result of that is we're going to get equal sharing of electrons. And when we have equal sharing of electrons, that is what is referred to as a nonpolar covalent bond. Or most people just straight up refer to it as a nonpolar bond, as that implies covalent bonding anyways. So nonpolar bond, nonpolar covalent bond, really the same thing. I personally would probably just call it nonpolar bond most of the time. Uh, but it is a covalent bond where we do have equal sharing of electrons. What does that mean in terms of that bond? It means that, frankly, the bond is kind of like neutral. Because those electrons are evenly distributed over the bond, there's no side that's like more positive or more negative than the other side of that bond. It's sort of like a neutral sort of bond that de develops. But what happens if we actually swapped out, say, a hydrogen for a fluorine. And what we know that's going to happen in this case is there is a difference in the electronegativity of these two elements. And if you remember, electronegativity increases up and to the right, decreases as you go down, fluorine, the most electronegative you could have. So what does that mean? It means that when hydrogen and fluorine share electrons, if this is the electrons and where they're hanging out versus, you know, this side, there is going to be a much stronger pool of those electrons heading towards the fluorine side than the hydrogen side. And this is going to result in an unequal sharing of electrons. And that is what is referred to as a polar covalent bond or just a polar bond.
what is the other consequence of this unequal sharing of electrons? Well, if most of my electrons decide to vacation over here on the fluorine side of the bond, that means I'm going to get a fairly good buildup of negatively charged electrons towards the fluorine. And that's going to create a partial negative charge. That's a delta symbol negative. And because the electrons are moving away from the hydrogen, that's going to build up a more positive charge on the hydrogen. And unlike in our nonpolar bond, where we have equal sharing of electrons, in a polar bond, we actually get this distribution of charge, where in this type of bond, there is a side that's more negative versus a side that's more positive. These are partially negative and partially positive here, charges. Now, why are they partially positive and partially negative charges rather than a full positive charge or a full negative charge? Take a moment and try to think about that question. Once again, the question is, why is it a partially positive charge and a partially negative charge rather than a full positive and a full negative charge? Hoping you're telling your computer screen now or whatever screen you're looking at while you're watching this, that it is because there is still sharing going on here. So because these electrons are still being shared, although they are being shared unequally, we don't get the full transfer of electrons like we do in an ionic bond. We actually still have some aspect of sharing. So it's still barely hanging on, for example, in this case, but those electrons are still being shared. So we create only these partially positive side and partially negative charges because electrons haven't fully transferred. Another way that we could represent this bond, as we will see, is through the use of what's sometimes referred to as a dipole arrow sometimes referred to as a dipole arrow, or sometimes referred to as a bond dipole. And these arrows always work this way. It always points to the more negative side of the bond. And the back end here that kind of makes like a plus symbol is to the more positive sign side of that bond. So that little dipole arrow is sometimes used to represent a polar bond. Partially negative, partially positive charges are sometimes used as well. And that's what we can see here. Uh, again, in this case, the green is a more negative, more electrons hanging out over there. Uh, the blue over there is kind of cool. Not a lot of electrons hanging out over there. Again, creating that partially positive and partially negative charges. So this unequal sharing of electron uh, creates this charge separation and creates this polar bond. And you can think of a polar bond as being sort of in the middle of the three types of bonding that we've talked about so far. So let's review these three types of bonding really quick. Uh, we have on one end of the extreme <clears throat> an ionic bond. And that is always between a metal and a non-metal. And once again, we're going to get a transfer of electrons from the metal to the non-metal, creating a cation from the metal and an anion from the non-metal. And once again, no sharing of electrons. Just that electrostatic attraction uh, that's going to hold that together. An example of this, any type of ionic compound like, say, sodium chloride. On the other end of the stream, uh, we have a nonpolar covalent bond, or you could just call it a nonpolar bond. And that is between two nonmetals. And because they're nonmetals, they're going to share very similar periodic trends, which means we're going to have equal sharing of electrons, uh, which means you can create really like a neutral sort of bond and no overall charge distribution. So something like fluorine that we saw are hydrogen. And in the middle, we have a polar covalent bond. And that also is between two nonmetals. 
That also involves sharing of electrons. And it is unequal sharing. That's creating that partially negative charge, partially positive charge. An example, obviously, is this guy right here. So again, on one end of the stream with an ionic bond, we have a complete transfer of electrons always from the metal to the non-metal and no sharing of electrons. On the other side of this, the bond here spectrum, we have nonpolar bond, two nonmetals, both gonna share electrons and they're gonna find a way to share electrons kind of equally with each other, creating really a neutral sort of bond. And in the middle is, uh, we have two nonmetals sharing electrons, but not equally sharing electrons, but not so unequal sharing of electrons that the electrons actually transfer like we have in an ionic bond, but there's some aspect of sharing and because they're not gonna be shared equally, uh, we do get a positive side of that bond or a negative side to that bond. And those are really the three major types of bonding that we see. And all of those bonds that we just see up here on the screen, the major goal again is to reach that noble gas configuration. Now, electronegativity, as I mentioned before, helps us distinguish between whether or not we will end up with, for example, a polar bond versus a nonpolar bond. Uh, you could also use it for ionic, but frankly, you don't really need to because as soon as you see metal and nonmetal, you should know that it is a ionic bond and you don't really need to worry about electronegativity. So. A lot of times people will use electronegativity and we'll talk about how to use it in just a second here. But a lot of times people will use electronegativity as a way to distinguish between polar and nonpolar bonds. Once again, electronegativity is the ability to attract electrons towards itself. It's related to electron affinity and ionization energy. Uh, so fluorine has a high electron affinity and a high ionization energy has a high electro, too many O's, negativity, and sodium on their hand, which is a metal, has low electron affinity and low ionization energy, which means take my electrons, please, has low electronegativity. It's not looking to really gain electrons or bring electrons to himself. So how can we use electronegativity to help us determine that? Well, a guy by the name of Pauline uh, came up with sort of a scale for electronegativity. And this scale helps us determine what type of bond we would expect to have. So Pauling scale for electronegativity runs from zero to four. Four is the most electronegative. And zero, uh, not so much. <laughs> Pretty much non-electronegative and no electronegativity. So we can calculate what is sometimes referred to as the change. That's what the little delta symbol means in electronegativity. And if you calculate the change in electronegativity, and it's anywhere from 0 to 0 0.4, it's considered a nonpolar bond, which means we would expect equal sharing of electrons happen there, sort of a neutral bond. If it's kind of above 0.4, which I guess would be 0.5, so we go above 0.4, which is really 0.5, to uh, below two, it is going to be a polar bond. So once again, sharing of electrons here, but unequal sharing of electrons. And typically speaking, if it's above two, it's going to be ionic. Once again, as I just mentioned a second ago, you really don't need the numbers here to help you determine that. And in fact, you could actually find some that are actually less than two, but still ionic. So two is just a rough estimate. There are some that won't really follow through on that. But once again, ionic is pretty much the simplest one. Metal, non-metal, ionic. Don't even think about it. twice. Going to be ionic, no sharing of electrons. So let's take a look at an electronegativity value table here that can be found in your book. And obviously it would be provided to you uh, if we needed it, or if you needed it, the numbers. Uh, but uh, when we look at it here, let's see how we could use this. Let's take our examples that we saw before, which is sodium chloride. Uh, we had HF and we had F2. 
All right, so if we were going to try to determine what is going on, and once again, our sort of scale, if you will, uh, difference in electronegativity, zero to 0 0.4 nonpolar, and a 0.5 to less than two polar, and above two ionic. All right, so looking at the table here for sodium, uh, looks like 0 0.9. And for chlorine there, it is, uh, where'd you go there? Three, it looks like there. All right, so to do the difference in electronegativity, frankly, you just take the larger number minus the smaller number, so you don't get a negative. And that's gonna give me a 2.1. That 2.1 is above two, and we definitely would think it's ionic. Once again, don't really need the numbers because that's a metal, that's a non-metal, that should tell me it's ionic, but you could use it if you want to. If we look at the next one here, like fluorine, uh, fluorine's right there, here, and that is a value of four, and this is a value of four, which means the difference in electronegativity would be four, four minus four that is zero that is definitely a non-polar bond covalent bond now when you actually do get a difference in electronegativity of zero uh, some people will sometimes refer to that as being a pure covalent bond perfect equal sharing of electrons at zero so if you see pure covalent bond uh, that is the same thing as a non-polar bond and it is the same thing as equal sharing of electrons. But sometimes people refer to a difference in electronegativity of perfectly zero as being pure covalent. Once again, still nonpolar, uh, but that's sometimes the terminology that is used. Here for hydrogen, uh, if we look it up there, that's a 2.1. Chlorine is a four. If we do our difference in electronegativity here for HF, that is four minus 2.9. Oh, I don't know, that's a... That is a four minus, not 2.9. I think 2.9 is uh, my answer there. Let's try that again. Let's write the right numbers. 2.1 looks like a winner. 2.1 sounds good. Uh, that's giving me a difference of uh, 1.9. Remember, 1.9 actually puts us right there at polar. Remember that uh, this is going to be a polar bond, definitely heading towards the fluorine here, being more electronegative in this particular case. 1.9 is almost to that two level of ionic, so it's like barely hanging on, but still hanging on, which is why we get partially charges. Now, in terms of ionic, for example, uh, if you look at something, say, like... Uh, Take a look here, uh, maybe like uh, lithium and like lithium and sulfur, for example. The difference there is like 1.5 difference. Again, less than two, so it's not perfect to two for ionic, which is why really for ionic, you should just look at metal and non-metal and determine that. All right, I tried some, why don't you try some here? All right, so let's say we had a bond between uh, carbon and hydrogen. Let's do a bond between uh, potassium and uh, nitrogen. Let's do a bond between, uh, let's do a bond between carbon and oxygen. Let's do a bond between sulfur and oxygen. And let's do a bond between nitrogen and chlorine. So for each of these, decide, is it ionic based on electronegativity difference and calculate the difference? Is it a polar bond? Is it nonpolar? And if it is polar, why don't you also draw the dipole arrow pointing in the correct direction? So take a minute or two and see what you come up with on this one. Okay, uh, let's take a look here and see. We'll start with our friend carbon and hydrogen. So carbon here, 
Uh, it looks like 2.5. Hydrogen is 2.1. So I'm just going to subtract those two. Difference in electronegativity. That's going to give me a 0 0.4, which is nonpolar. Really, why, for example, the cutoff's at 0.4. Most organic compounds contains carbon and hydrogen bonds. And most organic compounds are nonpolar, so that makes sense. 0.4 is sort of our cutoff for that. So carbon and hydrogen going to be nonpolar. Take a look at uh, potassium and nitrogen. Uh, potassium there is uh, 0.8. Uh, nitrogen there is 3. Uh, so we'll do our difference in electronegativity. Difference in electronegativity there is going to be uh, 3 minus 0 0.8, 2.2. That is going to be ionic. Once again, we don't really need it because that's a metal. That's a non-metal. I know it's ionic. I don't have to worry about it. Carbon and oxygen. Carbon is 2.5. Oxygen there is uh, 3.5, looks like. So once again, here, difference in electronegativity for that one, 3.5, larger number minus smaller number, going to give us a one. One is right about there in the middle there. That means that we would expect this to be a polar bond. Since this is a polar bond, we would actually draw the arrow pointing towards the oxygen as it is more electronegative. Uh, here, sulfur and oxygen. Sulfur is 2.5. Oxygen is 3.5 as well, actually. And in this particular case here, uh, we will end up with a difference in electronegativity going to be the same. Uh, 3.5 minus 2.5 equals 1, which is going to give us polar in this case. Also drawing the arrow pointing towards the oxygen, which is more negative. Nitrogen in this case is 3. And chlorine, in this case, is 3. Which means when I subtract that, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that's going to give me a 0. That's going to be a nonpolar bond or a pure covalent bond in this case. So this brings up a really good point. You could absolutely, if it is the same element, that's a nonmetal and nonmetal, uh, it will share those electrons equally. But you could also have two different elements that actually will have the same electronegativity value and share them equally, and it will also create a nonpolar bond. Why does that happen? It is sometimes referred to as the diagonal rule on the periodic table. For example, here, if we look at carbon and sulfur, they are diagonal of each other. If we look at our nitrogen and chlorine, they're also diagonal of each other, and it happens in a few spots along the way. It's not directly diagonal, it's kind of like uh, down and over one in terms of their diagonalness there. <laughs> so also like this type of move right about there. Um, and that's because, for example, nitrogen is further up on the periodic table, but chlorine is further to the right. So they kind of cancel out their differences in terms of electronegativity, in terms of their location. So that's one of the things you should watch out for is the diagonal relationship that can occur with two nonmetals. It is absolutely positively possible to have two different elements that actually will share the same electronegativity values and be nonpolar. Uh, if it is two atoms of the same element, definitely going to be nonpolar. Uh, but you could also have a nonpolar that's going to be from two different elements that share a diagonal relationship on the periodic table. Now, let's talk about in general, do we always need the numbers? The answer is we do not always need the numbers. So when you look at the periodic table and you're trying to determine polarity and stuff like that, remember that the overall trend in electronegativity is it increases, right, as we go up and to the right and decreases as we go left and down on the periodic table. So when we looked at something, for example, like carbon and oxygen. They are actually in the same period on the periodic table. And we know that oxygen is further to the right than carbon is. 
So they're in the same period, oxygen is further to the right. It is a safe bet to know, to assume that it's going to make a polar bond because of that. Now, we also saw sulfur and oxygen in a bond. They're in the same group and oxygen is further up in the group than sulfur. And remember, electronegativity increases as you go up in a group, for example. And that means that we could make a pretty safe bet that oxygen should be more electronegative and that should result in a polar bond. So in a lot of cases, you can make a pretty good educated guess if you're comparing two elements that are in the same row or period on the periodic table and two elements that are in the same group on the periodic table. And if they're both nonmetals and you're comparing them, it's a good bet that it's going to make a polar bond. And the one again further to the right or further up should be the more electronegative one and where the arrow would be pointing to. So in a lot of cases, you could just simply use the general trend in electronegativity to help you decide whether or not something is going to be polar or nonpolar, uh, or really polar in terms of that. <clears throat> so may not always need the actual numbers like we see here. Once again, they will be provided for you if you do need them, but otherwise you could kind of use just the general placement of where everybody is on the periodic table and make a pretty good guess in terms of polarity. All right, so as we saw there, atoms with widely different electronegativities tend to form ionic bonds, while other ones will share electrons. And once again, when we get metals and nonmetals together, very, very different periodic trends. Metals have all those trends that make them want to give away their electrons. Nonmetals have all those trends that want to gain electrons. So we get that transfer of electrons when they get together. And that's different than when two nonmetals get together because they're in a similar place on the periodic table. They will share similar periodic trends, which means they both want to hang on to their electrons. So again, the best they could do is some type of covalent bond where we're going to share electrons. And that's what we know. Again, ionic bonds, typically metal and nonmetal covalent bonds usually involving two nonmetals. So once again, here, uh, although there's no sharp distinction between polar and ionic, uh, one can follow the following rule. Uh, again, doesn't work for every sort of metal, nonmetal combination, but above two is typically ionic. Uh, but once again, don't really need the numbers, metal, nonmetal, right? Ionic or no, it's ionic. And that's probably going to suit you very well. Sometimes people refer to bonding, not necessarily as polar, nonpolar, are ionic, but they look at just kind of percent ionic character. So something with a hundred percent ionic character um, is an ionic bond, and something with zero um, ionic character is a purely covalent equal, perfect equal sharing of electron. And here's just a few examples of some of the different types of ones we talked about. Once again, no sharing of electrons happening here on the right with our ionic. Again, it's been a transfer of electrons over. Here we have sharing of electrons, but not equal, creating this bond dipole where this side is more negative, this side is more positive partially. And here we have a nice nonpolar equal sharing of electrons. And again, kind of like a neutral bond, if you will. There's no side that's more positive, no side that is more negative in this particular case. All right, well, again, not to make this super long uh, individual lecture here, I think we will stop here with part one of chapter 11. Uh, it's a good stopping place and we definitely will be back for part two as we're right into coming up next, how to draw Lewis structures for covalent molecules. Um, and we'll deal with geometry as well. So uh, for now, thank you for watching. We'll see you in part two of chemical bonding. Hope you've enjoyed part one of chemical bonding. Have a good one. See you on the next one. Hopefully soon. Bye-bye. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. You know, I saw this sign the other day on this new card. I was wondering what you thought it meant. Let me think.
Oh, yes. I think it is somebody's name. The name is Bond. Ionic Bond. Taken, not shared. <laughs>